Hey everybody, welcome to Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. How's everybody doing? It's episode 144, and we've got a spectacular guest tonight, Greg Fiddleman. He's a producer, engineer, mixer for the stars, basically. Everybody, I mean, Metallica, so, so many bands. So we're going to go through all of that tonight. Um, how you doing, Greg? I'm good. I'm good. Glad to be here. Thanks for uh, joining. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we've been talking about this for a couple of years, probably. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're just yeah. busy with doing records and things, and it's you know it's sometimes hard, but That's we right, have, yeah. haven't been talking about it for a while. So, yeah. so I thought uh, the timing was perfect though after after the Metallica record had come out. And, right. Definitely. Yeah. I think I, th I think it's good. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I saw I'm you do a whole some... saw you do a whole bunch of press with that and stuff. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, you just happen to be in Metallica studio right now, right? I am, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said, it's sort of um, nothing really happening here, specifically no project, but I I'm, I sort of have free reign over here, and I've got a bunch of my gears here as well. So I kind of am just, I'm sort of in between things. I'm taking a little chill time and just kind of you know, messing around with new gear or just kind of cleaning house and making sure everything's still working and <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Oh, it's a great place to be. Yeah, you know, and it's you know, I can fire up an app here, make a bunch of noise, and that's fun stuff. Over here. <laughs> so the, first, the first question that comes to my mind, since this is an amp kind of driven show, is what do you got there? Do you have like a, oh, what don't they have there? <laughs> yeah, like a Jose driven. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've got. I mean, you know, what Everything. I have is is a kind of a large collection that you add on top of what they've got floating around here. It gets pretty crazy, but. I mean, if it, if anyone ever liked it, I, it's probably here. And then a few that probably people never liked are even here. But, you know, I mean, there's tons of Marshalls. There's a bunch of Mesa Boogie Mark II C pluses. Um, you know, they have a hand, they got a bunch of them. I have, I oddly have two as well. Um, I bought a Mark II C plus like 1985 or something. It was my first, like, my first really loud head that i bought um it's funny that it ends up being you know here how many years ago that was um and it's still kind of a favorite it's pretty awesome but yeah all kinds of stuff ampegs and and uh just all kinds of stuff you know they use you know there's a bunch of diesels here obviously there's a bunch of freedmans here um you know every any if anyone's ever made a good sort of mar old marshall clone there's the one or two here <laughs> you know just everything, everything. yeah yeah that's yeah cool. well before we dive in <clears throat> they mentioned some of our uh our sponsors or dave were you going to say something oh, go ahead <clears throat> so let's uh let's talk about sweetwater this month is recording month which obviously works perfectly for greg uh so um right now and i'm going to share my screen so you guys can see it Sure, Greg's bought something from Sweetwater. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Many I have a lot of bags probably. of candy. <laughs> a lot so of candy. Recording month through the end of October 31st. Uh zero percent interest for up to 48 months. Um, make sure you check out the deals that they have going on. Uh microphones, you know, all I kinds of go down a little bit there. We have some uh, uh so are those bear no, those aren't barefoots, are they? I can't tell. <laughs> what these speakers yeah i no, i no, i was pointing oh, to those no those i don't think those are barefoots uh but i was gonna it? say if you want to buy a bracosti reverb please use our link <laughs> and go there and buy that well here, here you know you got some high-end studio monitors but yeah. use our link please <laughs> absolutely use the link that we provide in the video below and uh, anything you buy provides a little help to the show so uh but there's a bunch of stuff that's for you know for sale and you can again do interest uh, free for a 48 months if you want to finance so uh, make sure you check out sweetwater this month for recording month and we'll talk a little bit with greg about his favorite mics and, there is a really uh, good mic you should maybe go out and buy at sweetwater and that's the soyuz 
1973. Uh, it's a great condenser and it's amazing on guitar. Uh, how you spell that, I forgot, but <laughs> right. But right. it's it's amazing, uh, you know. Uh, like I always said, Pete Thorne did a little thing there when he was there, and he did a little mic shootout that they did a little video of for you know guitar miking basically. Right. And he's going through all these these mics and listening to you know all the standard you know standard stuff that you would normally think would be put on a guitar, and uh, and they put up that mic because it was on recommendation from Sweetwater. And Pete's like, holy crap, I think that's the best one. And then he went and just bought it right then and there at the store. <laughs> Brought it home, has used it ever since. Wow. So um, it's a really good, it's surprisingly a good guitar mic. Well, make cool. sure you guys use our link. And uh, we appreciate it. <clears throat> and yeah, so check out Sweetwater. Also check out fixpedalboards.com. Uh, lots of new products or products there, and his, he's going to have a new website, Dave. New website said. launching at some point in time. Yep, yep. And then That'll also Tomon. Make sure you check out Tomon.com. If you're in Europe, there is a link below. From Tomon, like you were if you were Sweetwater here. I actually don't think we've actually had anybody buy anything from Tomon yet. So, um, I, not like you win a prize, but come on buy some, <laughs> but, but, but buy something from tomon so um maybe we I, have more u.s viewers yeah i think we do I, but i haven't i mean i saw, I saw a bunch of clicks for tomon but no no purchases so but that's the funny okay. thing is they ship to the u.s too i heard that i did hear that at incredibly good prices and it's interesting yeah how do they do that? i don't even know how it gets here at that price i, I don't understand like free shipping or stuff they're crazy i'm not sure if it's free shipping but it's it's like really <laughs> okay <And laughs> michael torin so you use yeah so there you, there's this there you go cool hope michael's doing good um all right so that's it for the promos uh, so make sure you check out those guys. We all of the links down below our video. We also, <clears throat> thanks to Dave, sent me a video on now our, our t-shirt store should be working. So if you guys are watching on YouTube right now, which you should probably are, um, scroll down below and you should see our t-shirt store. So if there's any t-shirts that you want to buy, let us know. yeah, let us know if you don't see the t-shirts, please. Mark, when in doubt. You just ask the internet. True. That's true. A hundred percent. How do I do this? Well, I tried that, but yeah. But then I it was just a matter of like they change where they put things. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just anyway, back to uh Greg. So Greg, how you been? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, you know, sort of like I said, I'm sort of in between things. It was it, which feels pretty good is the last couple of years have been kind of crazy. Um, it's like Sounds crazy good. busy. Um, it's nice to have a little time to just kind of take stock and get organized. And um, just that alone is a bit of a job, but yeah, all's good. Not bad. So how long did it work? Did, did you work on 72 seasons? How long did it take to work on that? Um, we started we we, we that the beginning of that record is was really strange we started during the pandemic and we sort of were um we sort of try to tackle this how do we do this remotely kind of thing that a lot of people were trying to tackle I, we ended up being fairly successful with it but you know it sort of started with um <clears throat> when was that i think it was like probably may or june of 20 where it was more you know me and the, lars kept calling me and he was you know, getting pretty fidgety and wanted to go over riffs or, you know, whatever. We were supposed to do, we were supposed to do a, a version of the song Nothing Else Matters for a Disney film, March 2020, literally like the lockdown week. We were having going to have a session here at, at this studio. And it's like, you know, two days before, it's like, I think we're going to have to cancel this Disney's. I think Disney's going to stop production anyways. These things are looking crazy. So we were already talking anyways. And, and uh, you know, Lars was like, what can we do? We're going to be able to do something. And oddly, 
when I worked with them, end of 19, we did the, the S&M 2 thing with the orchestra, the couple shows, right. and it turned into an album project. Um, at the end of that, before I went back to Los Angeles, um, Lars had, you know, sort of Lars had recently moved. And he's like, I really got to get some, I want to get something going on in my home studio where I could like record something. He's, he's always got a place where he could like warm up or whatever, but not really set up to record. And he's not a technical guy really. But so we had set up, I was like, yeah, let's, let's do this. We'll mic the drum set up. We'll put two guitar, like two half stacks and a bass amp and a little keyboard. We'll kind of mic everything up and get a little Pro Tools rig. And then, you know, if you go down, you know, you know, his, his, his kids and all of his kids play. And sometimes they have little family jams and so, you know, also some friends come over, they want to jam or whatever. Like, let's just make it so it's not hard for somebody that knows very little about Pro Tools to just open up a thing and hit record and you guys can rock and record it. So when we were doing that, we had no idea how handy that was going to be. But, you know, come May or June of 20, he's kind of there by himself. I'm in L.A., and his kids, uh, his kids were there in, with him, um, and his uh, both of his well, his two oldest sons are pretty handy, especially Miles. His oldest son was kind of new Pro Tools and whatever, and, and he's like, "Oh, yeah, let me do some stuff. I want to try to record something." We did one of these little, uh, you know, songs for you know, pandemic things, where everyone was doing like a little Zoom demo kind of a thing. Right, right. So we did like an acoustic version of one of the band's songs. Um, and we had to record drums and I'm like, if miles could just open up a session and, and James had sent us acoustic, you know, him playing the acoustic and singing. So let's just, you just play along to that a bunch of takes and we'll cut something together and then we'll send that. I'll figure out how to get Kirk on it and how to get Rob on it. And it just sort of, that was sort of the first thing. And at that point it was like a zoom call and a FaceTime call at the same time. It was pretty hectic and chaotic. And then it's sort of after that, me and Lars talked, he's like, you know, do you think we could refine this a little bit and kind of get this, we, we maybe try to work on some songs or something? And it sort of, it started us on this crazy adventure of like, what can we do? What can't we do? What, you know, what are the restrictions and, you know, with latency and all that sort of stuff. And we ended up coming with a, up some pretty crazy ways for, for the guys to actually start working on some songs. So, you know, the first thing we sort of went through a bunch of riff tapes came up with a pile of riffs and then sort of here's 15 riffs you know james here's 15 things that lars liked you know what which ones are your favorites i'll pick five all right well i'm gonna send you i'm gonna i'm gonna fedex you a laptop kind of thing that's all set up and ready to go you plug it into this and that and we kind of went through that routine james is fairly technical he was able to do it pretty easy and then it was sort of like just get them playing together so that was probably like, I think that was in May or something of that year. And it, you know, they can't play together at the same time while he like, like they are in the same room, but like, we'd be like, all right, here's a click. Everyone's hearing a click. James is going to, James has got the click. He's going to play to the click. He's going to play the riff. Lars, you listen to that and play. But while James is doing that, he's not hearing the drums. Cause obviously it'll be crazy late. Um, right. So we play for like two minutes, stop. And then I, I was controlling Lars's computer from Los Angeles via, you know, splash top and all this other stuff. And our, one of our engineers, Jason was operating James's laptop from also in Los Angeles, but not in the same place I was. Wow. And then I'd be like, all right, then I would hit play on Lars's rig and we'd listen back to the riff with the drums. And then we'd saw, okay, what about that thing? Oh, maybe you should, maybe we should, you know, cut that piece in half or why don't you do a fill there and we'll transition to this other i've got another riff that we could try there and it was really clunky i mean especially at at the beginning it was really kind of frustrating but um but at the same time considering what was going on it's hard to kind of almost now already it's a little hard to remember what the mentality was being you know not being able to get together or whatever but it, it turned out to be really great and i think we put together probably 15 solid ideas um via the zoom thing and like i said after those guys did it then i would bring it to kirk and i would control kirk's computer from la and he was in hawaii and the same thing with rob and then a couple times it would be lars and james i'm sorry lars and kirk you know we just kind of mix it up 
came up with a bunch of great songs. And then at the end of 20, in, in November, I believe it was November, someone in the organization, the whole Metallica um, universe here, had an idea to do, a, to broadcast a benefit show from the studio here, HQ. The guys would play live. And they've done these sort of benefit things. It was sort of an acoustic based, at least originally the idea was acoustic. And we did this like a webcast from the building here. It's kind of next level crazy. And when the idea to do that was, you know, we did the crazy bubble thing. Everyone was testing and then everyone had to isolate together. Um, the idea, once we knew we were coming here, I was like, why don't we, why don't me and the band arrive a week early and we'll work on these songs together at the studio and then we'll do the, sh the rehearsals for the show. We'll do the show and then we'll hang out. We'll also stay a little late and then we'll do another four or five days afterwards. And it was kind of, a, it was a crazy, awesome uh, experience because we walked into the studio and we already had, no one had played together really yet, but yet we had like 15 songs that everyone kind of knew how it went. So it was like, you know, 20 minutes into rehearsal one, you know, take three of, you know, song X, you know, oh, this should be that way. I don't mm -hmm. like that part too. You know, we started arranging and really hit the ground running in a way that, you know, with hindsight was sort of, I don't think it could have happened any easier. I mean, I've tried other, I've done other projects with them and getting started sometimes is one of the harder things, you know, but this was just like when we got in the room and everyone was, it was barely said hello. Everyone was so excited to put the guitar on or whatever, or sit at the kit and, and get going. So it worked out great. That's awesome. well, that was, oh. yeah, May, uh, that was November. And then I went home and then we came back to another week. I think in December. And then the idea was like, why don't we once a month get together here? And then me and my wife came back up to the Bay Area and we just said, oh, why don't we just rent a house or find something to just instead of having to go back and forth since nothing was really happening in Los Angeles. And then we just kind of started working on the record. I mean, it's, we just slid right into it. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all things, you know, with that band, you know, things sometimes take a long time. So even though... You know, I was here all the time. I didn't have all four band members here all the time. So they were moving around, going home and back. And then even during the process, once we cut some tracks, um, I think, I don't remember when they did their first round of shows, but they went out and did some shows and people started doing shows that second summer. And then some other non-album related projects that, that we worked on. We did a master class thing and all these sort of little projects pop up in between. So it's, it's really gets broken up as far as the, the you know if you count the days of how many days we worked on the record i think we did this record quicker than the previous one but as a whole it took a little bit longer because there was all these you know crazy pandemic things at the front and then some other little projects and some touring that they wanted to do some makeup shows that they had canceled so all in all it takes you know two i think two and a half years or something but like I said, it wasn't two and a half years of just making that record. It's just that's the amount of time that passed from when we started till when we finished. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. amazing. And um, it's like you did pre-production before you went in, which is yeah, which we did pre-production before we did pre-production. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, and how'd they keep it a secret? That was the other thing, right? Uh, yeah, people, people were like shocked that, like, oh, they have a new album coming. Well, right. Yeah, we sort of the whole idea was like, let's just you know. Everyone kind of tight-lipped, and, you know, usually that does not work out, but it did this time. Yeah, I was going to well, say, usually even, it doesn't work out. Yeah, because yeah, someone mentioned it to someone, and they mentions it, mentioned it to someone, and... Yeah. 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 Or you learn to keep And, you know, one benefit of this place, too, is for, especially for the way that they work, is that, you know, we stay set up, so... Like, literally, from when they came in, once we got a drum sound probably March of 21 guitar sounds drum says we tracked the record live. It's a pretty intense um, setup that we get going, but nothing really moves. So, you know, two years later, that drum set is still set up. The mics are on it and, you know, in 30, yeah, okay, maybe two hours, me and my engineers can make sure everything's still working. Everything's still patched the right way and, and hit record. And that it's the drum sound from the record still. So, that also helps a lot with the starting and stopping. You know, we can just always 
Hey, Nick, what are you doing next week? All right, let's go in and let's let's re, we're gonna want to recut this one song or whatever it was, you know. Mm -hmm. That's pretty easy. And it's consistent too. Yeah, yeah. It's not like you're uh, setting up, breaking down, doing it at different times at different studios and different things, right. and it's just like never quite consistent. <laughs> right. Uh, it's easy to starting and stopping is hard, even with the stuff. Mm -hmm. staying set up with having to tear down and set back up it's really hard you spend a lot of time just kind of getting back and getting your footing you know yeah 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 that yeah. takes time yeah. what was there a, a particular vision sonically for the album um we didn't really have those comments a lot of the conversations that you normally would have at the onset of a record mm. we sort of didn't end up having this time because of the sort of the story I was just telling you, like we right. just ended up, we were so excited to work and you know, we already had the songs. Right. There's no time for like, what are we doing? What are we, you know, what kind of thing are we doing? So it really was more of like an extension of the previous record. Um, we never really had any conversations about it specifically. I certainly had thoughts and I, I know that they did. We never really had to have a conversation about it. Luckily, all of our ideas were, pretty in line with each other so there was never really any you know headbutting about direction or sonics or anything really and and the writing process of the songs was pretty pretty uh organic as well as you know there's always a little talk about fast songs slow songs you know you want to keep it kind of balanced um but it's sort of it's just sort of landed that way i, I want to say on its own i, I know there was some when we were putting the riff ideas together, we definitely, you know, you don't want to have, you know, 12 fast songs or 12 heavy, slow songs, or at least they didn't, you know, for a Metallica record, you want to kind of try to mix it up. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, but not really any specific conversations about that. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so how do you, Dave, how do you and Greg know each other? You know, the funny thing is I think I've met Greg several times over the years uh, briefly, yeah. briefly in passing. Um, but, but really it kind of got more into, uh, wasn't it when the Jose thing came up? Yeah. I mean, Jim, I mean, I, the I Jim knew root from that. Yeah. Jim root from Slipknot. I know, you know, he had, that's when I think maybe the first time we may have sort of met just mostly in passing he had a head that we use on the gray chapter record i don't even remember what year that was but um that was really we, we both were really into mm -hmm. and and it worked great because it was like the perfect thing that wasn't his normal like his overall sound that he does all his chunky rhythm stuff with but for solos and articulate parts and little ornament parts or whatever it was because it was so flag you know clean dirty heavy you know 80s metal whatever it was you know yeah. it kind of did a lot of different things really fast mm -hmm. and we both really liked that about it and it was kind of a different sound too from the other stuff that was on that record which we loved i think that's where we first sort of cross paths and then this the when during i guess this was during the pandemic the jose thing uh james hatfield's had a a Ma, Jose modded Marshall. I, I think he's had it since after the Black album or something. Um, he always mm -hmm. used, I think, Bob's. You know, yeah. Bob has one, and mm -hmm. he's always kind of used Bob's. And they bought one, and it was kind of at the end before Jose um, passed away or whatever. And when I first met the guys, I remember I saw it, and we tried to use it, and it didn't sound very good. And then everyone's, all the guys are like, yeah, that thing never really sounded right. And then on this record after that, I remember pulling it out again. I'm like, oh, this thing's got to sound great. I've seen these amps before they're killer. And it kind of just, it was weird. And then I had a lot of time to think about these kinds of things during the pandemic. And I'd called James and said, dude, do you mind if I grab this Jose head and just let me make some phone calls? Let's get to the bottom of this and let's if it can sound good, let's make it sound good. And that's when I texted you, Dave, about, mm -hmm. you know, oh, remember me and Jim Rude, blah, 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 and we've got this head. I know that you're familiar with these mods, and this thing doesn't make any sense to anybody. And I don't know if you remember it clearly, but it had a bunch of, I like, do. writing, like, little taped-on pieces of paper with sort of directions. Yeah, but never, I like, If you read all the directions, it was kind of like, now I'm more confused than I was before I read the directions. Like, it didn't. 
there was something yeah. not right. And then I remember you saying like, oh yeah, something was backwards or whatever. Oh, there, there, there was all sorts of weird things with that amp yeah. um, and some broken things. And yeah. uh, one thing that was weird is there was a 200 watt output transformer in it. Right. Which isn't stock to the amplifier. And I'm not sure why it was ever there or I don't know why it was ever put in there. Right. Um, so we changed that actually. We changed it yeah. to a 100 watt output transformer, one of mine. And I went through the circuit and went through everything and, you know, and I made it sound good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, right. I didn't really, uh, it's still the mod. I, I didn't sit yeah. there and alter the, the thing because it, I, I, you know, I just made it the best it could sound. Right. You know, and, and it did sound really good. Yeah, it was good. It, and James loved it. And that's a, that makes a, that album is a, a major part of the sound that he had on this last record. I mean, he loved it. And uh, it's, it's all over the record. So it became one of the amps that makes up his kind of main rhythm sound. He loves it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that the yeah. uh, three in one mod? Dave? yeah it's not like massively high gain or anything it's just uh you know everyone always get i always say that you always get hung up on that uh you know like uh, real guys don't use that much gain really right yeah <laughs> and, and greg knows it's just it's yeah. like that it's is like the worst thing part. you could do for a mix or anything you know for this you know you want more percussiveness and you want more right clean and it'll sound bigger and it'll sound much larger and yeah. better tone and when you start stacking guitars especially yeah and, you know. and like a player like like james you know when you get somebody that that is that in tune with what they're doing and and what they're trying to sound like like if he's mushy to him i mean he he's pretty uh particular too i like guess you know, he if it gets mushy at all, he's, he's out. You know, it's like I can't. You know, what I what I'm doing is not coming out the speakers. It's not. It's too something. Or you know, the low end's woofy, and it kind of when I thump it, it mm -hmm. all I hear is woof over all the articulate parts. And so he, um, I mean, I often want to put more gain than probably he likes. The same thing with Kirk. Um, they both try to go. Oh, this is too whatever. You know, it's almost getting a little too too dirty. I'm like, oh, but it sounds you know. Nah, it sounds mean and nasty, <laughs> snarly or whatever. Yeah. So it's always a back and forth. But but yes, both the uh it's interesting sometimes when you get those guys that you know, especially when they grow up with you know older style amps where you didn't you know the highest gain amp in 1983 it was like it's probably considered a you know a clean amp now or something. Yeah, it's like a JC made um, hundred and that doesn't right, really have that right. much gain. You yeah. Know. And that's how they kind of they grew up with that kind of a that feel and they still they still like it mm -hmm. you know they right. still are used to it so yeah what kind of volume are they recording at What's pretty the, loud yeah i mean it's always a combination of amps so like you know jay what we always dragged um there was the the jose a mark 2c plus plus that he's had forever a diesel and a like a wizard it's kind of like a you know like a plexi marshall kind of a wizard but with a clon pedal in front of it mm -hmm. and those four amps are kind of always running and then depending on what the song is or whatever the the blend between those amps changes so it's not always four amps at the same time but depending on what you know usually it's three but um and it leans into you know there's usually one that's the main thing and this just adds a little of that and that a little of this it's always crazy you hear the sound and you like solo the wizard or whatever right you're like oh that sounds ridiculous that doesn't sound good at all let's mute that and you mute that and it's like oh shit the, the bottom oh, just that... dropped out or whatever it was yeah you know you can't imagine when you listen to it by itself that it's doing what it's doing it's very it's an interesting thing that happens but um yeah and the and, and again you know i'll push if i push the wrong thing you know he might be oh you know i'm losing the the facial thing that I had a minute ago, it sounded more aggressive before and now it's too boomy or whatever. A lot of that has to do with just the, the balance between the amps and or the mics, mm -hmm. I suppose. But mm -hmm. yeah, but it's 
quite loud in the amp room. We've got, <laughs> I, I don't know how many cabinets we've got. Probably, a, there's probably a dozen cabinets out there that are mic'd up. And depending on what heads you're at and what cabinets you're going into, but it's, you know, it could be four really loud heads going out at the same time in the room. It gets pretty hairy. Yeah, crushing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry if this is a noob question, but are, are they, is everybody kind of uh, off into their own isolated situation or are they in the same room with, with Lars? But when we cut, the, they're all four of them are in the same room. Okay. But all the amps are not in, in the room with the drums. This, we've got a really big, I mean, the, where the drums are is actually the room where the guitars are. There's also a vocal within there is bigger than the drum room. Hmm. Um, just be, I, I don't know why that is, but it, it's the way it worked out. Um, so all the amps are in another room. And we try, you know, we baffle them with big, fat, foamy guys. There's a little bit of crosstalk here and there. But you don't really get, you don't get any guitar bass really in the, in the drum mics and in the drum room mics every once in a while the bait the low end of the bass kind of sneaks in there but it's kind of cool so yeah, as long as they're playing as long as they're playing the same song the <laughs> yeah right playing. exactly <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 you know bleed bleeds okay there's bleeds good there's it, it, bleed got, as long as they're old, playing the same song all yeah. sorts all sorts of old records that we all love and grew yeah. up with oh my god if you solo some of the tracks it's like yeah. Wow. Listen to that hi hat, Mike. That's got all sorts of guitar in it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But it makes it sound alive in a way. It gives it. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Mistakes yeah. and and excitement and, I mean, I'm one for the classic stuff. So it's you know, tempo variations, mistakes. Right. Not everything to yeah. the grid. It sounds like a real band then. You right. know, it's just like yeah. in the minute you make it, you know, be like a uh, one of these newer bands, you know, where you can just right. you, can, you, you can remix the song in a few minutes. You can just cut and paste the whole thing up, <laughs> move it around. Right. Yeah. You know, um, yep. it just sucks the life out of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a when you get and, a, you know, when you've got four players or five or whatever, there's a when they're interacting, there's a push and pull that creates some of the stuff that makes you feel like it's rocking or it's exciting, I think. Yeah. And um, it's really easy to mess that up. You know, you could, sure. yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. If you've ever heard John Bonham's drums quantized. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, that yeah, work. yeah. Beato, I think did that. And it's just like, you listen to it and you're like, Oh my God. <laughs> Right. <laughs> that is amazing how it just sucks. Oh, the oh my fucking it. God. Yeah. I, don't, I haven't heard that. I bet that's crazy. Oh, yeah. I think Rick Beato did a video where he quantized John yeah. Bonham's drums. And in the that's video, cool. you hear just the two versions right next to each other. And, and you're like listening to that and you're like, holy shit. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. holy shit. Wow. That's just not good. Well, I'm. I'm uh, really glad to hear that uh, Metallica is using real amps in, on the album. Um, yeah, because I know live they're they're using fractals. Yeah, or... live they're using fractals, <sighs> but but you know, there's a lot of reasons why they're doing that, and and you know sometimes, especially for them, consistency is more important than the overall sound of something. Mm -hmm. As long as it's the same every day, um it helps them stay grounded and whatever. And that has a lot to do with this is so much more easy for in their, in your, their in ears and front of house guys. And there's just no surprises when they were using real amps with, you know, speaker cabinets and ISO boxes under the stage or whatever. It's, you know, even though that stuff is in theory, the microphones are mounted or whatever, it, it changes every day. I mean, it changes yeah, every day, even with, with what they're doing with the fractals, but mm -hmm. just the changes are very minimal. You know, the rest of the gear is probably what's changing, but, but it just helps them um, stay as, you know, as consistent as possible. And then you just make that work, you know? Yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah. 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 It doesn't quite, <laughs> doesn't quite sound right to me, but okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I'm not using a fractal uh, ever because I think it's the best thing, but uh, I, I get it. I it's get not, it. Yeah. You know, yeah, I get it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've seen what, you know, what weirdness can happen, but 
you know, yeah. when there's no sound check, <laughs> you know, right. and they're going to play in front of 60,000 people. It's right. Gonna, right. Know, the first right, chord, right. they know they're going to hear it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. true. Unless the wrong patch is on and then. Oh. Correct. Yeah. I don't, it's a, but I don't, I don't believe, my, you know, my own personal beliefs in this has, I mean, I understand why this is done and all that. Obviously I deal with a lot of high end cus customers and clients with rig building and everything. But, you know, there is something to be said for real amps, and there's something to be said yeah. for monitors and not in-ears, and there's right. something to be said, you know, for all of that. And there's pluses and minuses of both. Yeah. I think if a band plays like a band and they play together, I think really like real amps and monitors are a great, great, great thing. <laughs> <laughs> right because it yeah. sounds exciting it, when you go see it it just sounds exciting right. quiet stages yeah. now and things like that it just mm, doesn't quite have the same excitement as it once did right no, i you know, know what you mean it's, yeah that's yeah very true but then um, again yeah. i don't think pa sound as good as they used to either but <laughs> yeah too much digital yeah yeah you know it's, you know it's like Hey Greg, you got to mix instead of mixing on the SSL, or I think that's what's behind you. Sorry, you yeah. got you got to now mix on a you know I don't know, a, you know Pro Control digital console or something. Right, like, you know. which I've I've uh, found myself needing to do, and it's not even. It's, yeah. it's, it's a, a different whole different thing workflow. It's a different it's thing. Different, yeah. And you can never push a digital anything digital. Right. Don't push it any. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. It's not going to be warm. Yeah. Well, it just doesn't. You know, an old an old console you can push the hell out of it and distort and it'll distort in a great way. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of like a guitar. I always thought like once I started, you know, grew up as a guitar player, but once I got into this stuff and really started to understand consoles and was able to work on, you know, Ace one like a Neve console or something mm -hmm. or an SSL, it's not unlike a guitar amp in mm -hmm. that it has it has a sound and you have to dial up that sound on an analog console you have to find the spot you know the sweet spot where mm -hmm. the level is this is what this con this is when this console sounds best and you have to kind of find that and mix into it and around it much like a guitar yeah you know, it's like yeah, head, yeah. i think yeah like where a digital console that does not you, you you it's more like a stop sign that you have to try to avoid you don't want to ever hit you know yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like on a Neve console, you have your, you know, your rotary uh, switch uh, that's, you know, adjusting the gain and stuff, and there, there's a sweet spot right there, you know. And then you got right. your fader, but there's a sweet spot where that, you know, yeah. the snare mic. Well, it sounds good when that is right here, yeah. and it's just breaking up. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And then it's exciting. Yeah. So, Ryson Bison has a question. Thanks for the super chat. What kind of speakers uh, do Kirk and James use, and how many tracks do they go down to when tracking guitars? Um, most of these cabinets are loaded with Celestians. Most of them are the ones we use. Most of them are older Celestians. There's, I think, there's maybe one or two cabinets has some vintage thirties that are kind of newer, but um, most of them are older, like greenback i know there's a couple of like late 70s blackback cabinets that sound amazing most of them are 30 watts 30 watts some of the g12 h some are m's just just definitely varies there's a couple of slant cabinets that we use um there's definitely a couple of mesa cabinets though that have the vintage 30s and it's it's always a mix and a match and you know yeah you know at this point I've, i mean i probably can go look at the cabinet and say oh i think that's the that's there's a cabinet that's got 20 watt celestians 25 mm -hmm. and 20 watt 4 by 12 in an orange cabinet that sounds killer um for some stuff oh the it's orange cabinets are, can be cool with celestians shoved in them and stuff yeah 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 really that cool. cabinet sounds really good mm -hmm. um so it's mostly older celestians um and then as far as like how many tracks i mean you know like i said i think with james we had always had four amps rolling but i did not always all four amps are on and then you know each cabinet each cabinet has at least two mics on it i don't always use both mics so there's usually a con usually a condenser and, and a dynamic on them depending on the cabinet and what I'm, we're doing with it sometimes it's just that the condenser goes away but uh it'd be four tracks of guitar 
that's recorded before the amps go onto separate tracks and then i can always blend them there mm, we tried right. before trying to blend it on the way in which i kind of like the committing part of that <clears throat> that's how i've done other records like slipknot sometimes i'll do that but uh I've, i learned after working with these guys they might later want to make an adjustment and then if you've committed to something uh, okay i'm gonna we either play it again or we gotta reamp it and rebalance it and so it's best to have it um sort of separate where you could do the same thing and kirk kirk very similar for the rhythms very similar for solos kirk usually had three had like a rectifier and a really great 100 watt marshall master volume like a 79 that just sounds insane and then he's got a randall i can't not remember the name it's like one of his a, like a Kirk Hammett model, I can't remember the name of it that we sometimes use. That's got a really great honky mid range. Did you say on the record that the B Deluxe and then uh, and then, then some sort of JMP Marshall was used for on tracking? Or? Yeah, for 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 Kirk's rhythms, we used a a fifty watt JMP Master Volume, like a seventy nine, and a B Deluxe. Some, sometimes it was the Deluxe, and sometimes it was the you know that Kirk has like a old freeman head that's got some weird knobs on it that aren't labeled it's old yeah there's a weird proper. there's an older one one is a, yeah. uh, a a jj 100 that's up there and i think an older yeah. b, an older b 100s up there too yeah, yeah yeah so just sort of depending on what you know where he was what he wanted to do and whatever right um yeah yeah so cool but as far as like double tracking i'm not sure if his question was about double tracking or not he, there's always James always double tracks his guitar. Kirk doesn't doesn't double track his often, but James's double track sometimes will end up, you know, coming on and off during a song or something like maybe it pops in on the choruses up the center or something like that. So it's yeah, not cool. a ton of double tracking, mostly single. So, uh, Greg, how did you even get into this? I mean, I grew up a guitar player. I mean, you know, grew up in Los Angeles. I love music ever since I was a, you know, single digits. Um, I think when I was, a, when I was 11, I sort of decided I thought I wanted to play guitar and I had a very, very kind grandmother who uh, made sure that I was able to figure out how to learn how to do that. And then, you know, my, my mom has a musical background. She was a singer when she, before she was married and my dad, also was a big music lover he's more into like country stuff my dad also played a little guitar and some banjo and stuff so it was sort of always around music and and i just sort of fell in love with sort of you know first stuff beatles stones etc and then kind of you know I'm, I'm the right age to be like a kiss kid you know 1977 sort of discovering that and thought that was a great idea and I just really got into it especially like in junior high high school and that's sort of just what i did I was always in bands loved it um as soon as i was out of high school um more bands figured out how to get in a band that's you know with somebody that knew how to get gigs at the troubadour or the whiskey or whatever when i was 18. um so sort of always did it and got a i was in a band called rhino bucket in the late 80s mm -hmm. yeah, um, i remember yeah and uh me and uh, a friend of mine, George, who was the singer, guitar player of that band, got lucky enough to convince the people at Warner Brothers to give us uh, money to make a couple records. So that's really where it started. You know, we toured a bunch. We never really broke, but uh, it was an awesome experience. And so the first record, the first Rhino Bucket record we did, I always was the guy like making the demos. I always was freaky about tone and whatever. It's, just naturally and i always figured out how to make four track we had a little four track cassette recorder um the first record we did we got really lucky to get a, a very very young brendan o'brien was the engineer on that record wow. and at that point like at that point brendan's discography was had like three things on it you know <laughs> the black crows he did the first black crows record before that and not much else before that um so it was really we got really lucky and that guy was kind of like a bit of an eye opener thing for me like this guy knows how to work all this stuff that i had no idea. you know 
back nowadays, if you're a kid, you know, you know what, a, you know what an 1176 is, you know what an SSL is because you've got plugins, right? But in 1987 <laughs> or nine or whatever it was, like you walk into a recording studio, you don't even know what a compressor is. I mean, you have, it's, you just don't know. Um, right. So to see somebody like he just knew how to do everything and make it sound great. And he also would be like, when I was working on a part or something, he'd like, oh, hey, what, let me see the guitar for a second. What if you tried something like this? You know, he'd pick up the guitar and play. And it was kind of like, ding, like, hey, yeah, this guy is a guitar player. But he also knows how to do all this other stuff. This is interesting. Mm. And you know, went on to that record. And the second record, we worked with a guy named Terry Manning in Memphis, who um, you know, had worked on a bunch of ZZ Top records. He worked on some Zeppelin records. I mean, he's he worked, he was a staff engineer at Stax in the 60s. Um, he had his own place in Memphis, and he was like super, super generous um with taking the time to like answer any questions or tea, like but even ask us hey you want to help me i got a cop a vocal i'm like what is that <laughs> like i'm going to take you sang the song four times we're going to get the best lines and when i tell you i want 16 you patch this from here you go here the old school literally old school comping you know and like when we were getting guitar sounds he was kind of a nut about guitar amps and stuff he had an insane collection of really great guitar amps and that's when i really started to get like speakers specific and head specific and what where are you putting the mic why are you putting it there why did you go move that what happens when you move it because i would listen you know and it just again he was super generous and that definitely that experience was like i, I still love being in a band and i love performing and i love writing songs and, and touring was fun but a couple of years after that and things sort of never really took off for us and the music business sort of was changing in general. It's sort of the Nirvana Nevermind record broke. And we were like a hard rock band from L.A. This was kind of no one was really that interested. I, I, I'm not sure that we were all that great either, but that's another, <laughs> that's another interview. Um, but but um, it seemed like the writing was on the wall and we had a couple of rough tours at the end. I was like, man, I got. I can't, I don't see where this is. I did no longer could see where it was going, but I could see, like, I really liked making those records. I thought I was, I thought I loved playing the guitar, which I do. And I still do. But at that time I was like, I think maybe I like this other thing a little bit better. Like I want to record the guitar. I want to do that. And, uh, had a couple of, you know, ideas of how to do that. And the first couple ones didn't work out. And then I finally, after talking to some people, I was like, someone's like, you just got to work your way. Like Terry Manning, for instance, he would tell a story like he used to, he's like was making coffee and sweeping floors at Stacks and whatever it was, 1967 or whatever it was. And like the engineer got sick and, you know, Otis Redding is showing up in, you know, in an hour or whatever it was. I was like, Terry, you know how to work this? Yeah, sure. And boom. Now Terry Manning's making a you know a classic R and B record out of Memphis, and that story sort of you know into my head. It's like you just got to figure out how to be. You got to learn. You got to be good, and you got to figure out how to be be there when somebody needs something. And so my idea was to get a job as a runner at a studio, and I I first got a, a job. What was the name of that the track record in North Hollywood? I think. I remember yeah. track record. Right, right, yeah. And I was I worked there for like a couple of weeks and and I really I've quickly realized like, oh, this is the right thing, but this is the wrong place. Oh. This is like they're making RB records here, they're making hip hop records here. Not that I don't like that music, but that wasn't what I thought I was gonna be really great at or really wanted to do. It's like where are they making the records that I love? And Sound City was one of the studios that was on my radar. There's a couple of them. And uh, call them, not hiring, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, call, I would call them like every other week. And I called them one, like one day and it was raining in LA and the studio manager, Siobhan, it's like, oh, um, yeah, we're, the parking lot's flooded, but you know, we, so I think we're going to have an opening when you come, come by tomorrow or something. Okay. So I came by the next day for like a little interview, walked in where she's interviewing me. She was awesome. And this is like one of those moments like, Oh, something good happened. Uh, you know, Joe Barisi, I'm sure Dave, mm -hmm. you know, Joe, right. Yeah. 
So I know Joe from early, early days of Rhino Bucket. He, the, the way that we met was weird. Like he, a friend of mine that worked at Westlake, a friend of actually the singer from Rhino Bucket, George, his name was Bill Molina. He's also a really successful engineer producer, still working, still out there. He was, he was, had an engineering gig at Westlake in, in LA and he was like an assistant or something. And it was like Christmas time one year. And they gave him like, Oh, you have like four free days, you know, the, during the Christmas break, you do whatever you want. And he said, Hey, Greg, you know, why don't you and George come in and let's do some demos. Great. So we went in to do some demos and he knew Joe because Joe was now starting to engineer some stuff and Joe worked at Westlake and Joe came by to help bill because bill didn't really know how to work everything just yet. So that's when I first met Joe. And then Joe would come see Rhino Bucket play once in a while. And we sort of became light friends. But we knew each other. And when I was in Siobhan's office at Sound City, Joe Barisi walked out of Studio B and saw me and said, oh, dude, Greg, what are you doing here, man? I'm like, oh, I'm interviewing for a runner gig. And he looks at Siobhan and says, Siobhan, you should hire this guy. He's awesome. <laughs> so she did. There you go. And, you know, I was definitely was like, oh, there it is. There's That's the first little, like, snuck in or whatever you want to call it i you know i worked there i worked my tail off i was like if i'm going to clean toilets and make coffee it's going to be the cleanest toilet and the best coffee in the city so i just hustled and uh you know garth garth richardson was doing records there and we hit it off and uh george draculius who i s sort of knew from the rhino bucket days a little bit indirectly but we knew each other met Jim Scott, Sylvia Massey, all these people. I was as a runner. And then, you know, whenever I had a chance to go in and learn stuff, I'd go in the control room when there wasn't a session or something and try to figure stuff out, write down lists of questions. And then the same thing happened. One day, I think it was a Cheryl Crow. Cheryl Crow was like working on her second record and something happened and the assistant couldn't be there. And the engineer who I knew was like, man, you know, Studio B, right? You know that patch band? I'm like, yeah. He goes, Shimon, can I, can I get Greg in here? We need we need somebody, and Jeff could make it in today or whatever. So now I'm sitting in the control room, making a helping them make a Cheryl Crow record, kind of like whoa, crazy. And it just kind of went on from there. And then you know, months later, Rick Rubin's in Studio A, making Johnny Cash records with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers as the band. And they and Rick, you know, Rick was kind of a that's tall that's a big project with a lot of players and it's pretty intense so they wanted two assistants so was, oh greg why don't you be the second assistant in there so now i'm in there Great. and then like i said i kind of knew rick a little bit from the rhino bucket days we never worked together but we'd cross paths several times and he kind of was like i think he recognized me we never really talked about it but he kind of like definitely gave me a second look like is that the guy oh and we just kind of hit it off, and then when he would come in, he would like, "Oh, I want to have Greg as the as the assistant." So I started doing that, and it just kind of goes on from there. I, I taught myself Pro Tools, or that like Bill, my friend Bill Molina, actually was part of that whole endeavor. But I saw Pro Tools was pretty new at that time for a rock studio. It was very new. Um, no one was, not very many people were using it yet. It was very, you know, ah, Pro Tools. Right. Um, especially at Sound City, you bring anything digital in that building. It was, it was, yeah. And, ah. People would melt. Yeah. But right. um, but I saw, I saw something in, like, what guys were doing with Pro Tools. and like, this is a cool, there's something there. That, that's, that could be useful. I didn't, I didn't realize it would do what it did, but I thought I should learn it. And I've yeah. saved up enough money to get a little rig and learned it. And then, you know, next thing you know, I'm, helping rick comp vocals on a chili peppers record a couple of years later i mean it just sort of like all sort of just unfolds you know yeah just that's yeah. great uh this is a great comment from uh chris rapier he says hey greg don't know if you remember me but i worked with you at sound city as a runner yes. in 96 97 really happy for your success you deserve it i think i owe you 80 bucks too <laughs> <laughs> i remember chris that's crazy I was going to say that that was a long time ago. Look at those dates. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's so, it's so funny when you, when you're talking about all these studios and you talk about track record and everything, you know, I, you know, I started in the business, uh, you know, 87, 88 as a, right. as a delivery guy for Andy Brower's studio rentals. 
Okay, right. And 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 during that time, you know, during that heyday from say that to eighty eight to ninety one, maybe I did that part of it or somewhere yeah. ninety. I it was that, and then I moved yeah. on to doing it. It snowballed from there. But right. uh, I just remember all these studios, so I just right. remember them fondly and well. I remember delivering we, gear to uh, Bob Rock at One on One Studios when the Black Album was being done. Oh, right, sure. Yeah. <laughs> we rented some heads. I think we rented heads from Brower. Oh, probably. That first record at at Holly. We were at Hollywood Sound. We doing overdubs at Hollywood Sound. Remember that over on Selma there? Yeah, yeah, sure. Over by Sound Factory, yeah. Yeah, we were a red, a red Mar- hundred watt Marshall head that sounded killer. <laughs> was it a Lee Jackson mod in that amp? It probably was. I think yeah. it was. I think I remember yeah. that. I amp. mean, at that time, I didn't know a whole lot about anything, but um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no. It's 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 yeah. It's funny. It's just funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, I miss Freddie, all those spots. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Great studios. A lot of them. Yeah. Freddie Forbes, hey guys, first live chat I've caught. Thank you both for doing this. I listen every week, and from someone who owns Freeman Amps, Dave, what you do for customer service is extraordinary and sells amps, so thank you. Well, I try really hard because every single fucking day I'm inundated with... I am like crazy person and decide to do all the customer service for Freedman, uh, which is uh, maybe dumb, but... So out uh, of the 3,000... IRXs, you got how many emails do you think? You oh, got? I don't even know. That's impossible. <laughs> it's an email box, just you know, you clear it out and then it fills up and clear it out and it fills up, clear it up and fills out. Wow. But I mean, if you know, if anything has to be facilitated or parts sent or things, I hand that off to someone. But I never see the point of doing it another way because the person that's answering the email can't answer the question. And then they have to ask me anyway in an email. And then I have to type the answer back to that person in an email. And then they have to relay yeah. that to the customer. Well, at that point, I should have just answered the customer. I mean, just, I mean, it. I get yeah. used to doing it. I, you know, sit there in the morning with coffee and just look at the emails and then bang my head at the table on the table a few times after I am right. like, oh my God, <laughs> really? <laughs> Hey, Dave, any update from the uh, customs thing with Justin Hawkins? Oh, no. Uh, no, not at all, actually. I I supposedly had a claim going, but I haven't heard from them yet, so I'm going to have to bring that back up the first of the week with them. Okay. Never ship anything to England anymore. <laughs> Since Brexit and they became their own entity, right. it is an utter nightmare and uh you know they have their own customs they have their own yeah. everything now and and it just seems like it's, it's just a shit show oh, that's horrible i yeah. sent an amp to justin hawkins and um it got there his guy called fedex and said okay so i see it's in customs and it's going to clear i assume I haven't heard anything. Is there anything I need to do? Oh, no, it should clear in a few days. Well, the next contact to FedEx is, oh, we're sending it back to you here. Ugh. And I'm like, uh, and I called him. I go, it shouldn't come back. Don't send it back. You know, like, oh, it's too late. It's already, oh, boy. has already left. I go, well, no one's ever contacted me. No one's ever contacted my, the customer. And what on earth am I going to get charged for this amp to come back to me? Right. I had a special rate going over. And it wasn't that much, $175 maybe to ship the amp. On the way back, they sure as shit charged me $700. Oof. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and, and not only that, uh, when it got back, we opened the box up. We, the first thing we noticed is the amp's upside down in the box. And then we notice all the screws are out of the back panel. That just doesn't fall out. The, the no. back wood panel that goes on the back of the amp. And then also only one chassis screw is in it. And all the rest of the screws are in the bottom of the box. And the amp, chassis's just been flopping around in the head box in there. Right. They took it apart 
and didn't put it back together and just threw it back in the box and shipped it back. Yikes. And I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Next time I'm going to pay the duty. So, you know, and then if I have to ship to England again, it's just like, no, nah, I'll pay the duty and then bill it back to the customer. Yeah. Because then they'll just automatically bill my account for it. Uh, the joys of shipping. Um, so, Greg, I don't have any problems. I've shipped amps all over the world for years. Never once has ever anyone returned I, out of that's... hundreds of amps, hundreds and hundreds of amps. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. Um, how is it working with the Chili Peppers? That's well, I was always awesome with those guys. I mean, I've I've done a couple different projects with them um as early as uh the californication record which was mostly vocals i worked on on that record and then i did a couple sat in on a few sessions covering for jim scott on the oh my god what was the name of that record stadium arcadium the, the one after not same the one after uh californication oh, and man. then i did the full record the one where Frashante wasn't in the band um or one of the two that he, they did um with uh Dave Navarro. Um, no, no, no not with Navarro. No, with Josh. Oh, with Clean Josh. Clean yeah, yeah. Um, that was super fun and crazy and cool. Um recorded a ridiculous amount of songs with that. But uh you know, again, talk about real bands, right? So you get those dudes in a room, you get you know, Flea and Chad, and whether it's John or, or Josh or whoever, you know. I mean, of, even with, you know, Anthony singing live a lot of the times, I mean, what's coming off the floor, you know, is like most of the record. It's kind of crazy. It doesn't happen that much anymore, I don't think. It's a mm. shame. But, I mean, those records especially, you're just cutting that thing live. It's, and it's ridiculous what they could kick out. Right. Mm -hmm. Capture the moment. Yeah, it's kind of it's always that, that kind of stuff's always super inspiring to me where it's you can't believe how little you've done, how how like how much little work you've done and what's coming out these speakers is like already this is something I'm listening to the radio. What the hell? You know, it's it, that kind of stuff is always still blows my mind when I hear it that way. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um do you do you ever mix with headphones and what monitors do you use i do um a pro act pro act studio reference 100s are still my main um monitor um <clears throat> but in the last like handful of years like so many people i think listen i mean obviously people listen on their phones too um but so many people listen to records on headphones i i believe more than used to um sort of pay a little more attention to that than I ever did in the past, probably the last like seven or eight years, maybe. So I do spend some time in headphones. I like the, I have a bunch of pairs of the blue, what are they called? Mixfies, Mixfy headphones. Yeah, they're sort of a powered right. thing. <clears throat> Those feel, I know them pretty well and they feel pretty natural to me. I rarely have any surprises if I, work a while I, mean, I remember back in the early days i would try to mix in headphones and uh it was always a disaster <laughs> you know, get it into it. go to the mains and all of a sudden oh my god what the hell this is what did i do whack. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh I, whether the headphones have became have gotten better or whether it's just my perspective on it has changed or something but uh yeah i like to work in headphones a little bit it's easier sometimes to uh really get into the weeds you know yeah. yeah yeah i can i can imagine especially when you have so many layers of things sometimes right sometimes yeah. you can hear things just the the nuances of things better when the speaker is yes. like right just boom right on your ears you know right. you're like oh now i hear that delay or that thing that's going right. on there okay yeah. too loud <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um and do you do what everybody else does and just after you're all done, you go into the car and listen to how it sounds inside the car. I, I don't do a car test that much anymore. I certainly used to do car tests. I mean, that was like the thing, right? 
I think at one at one point when I was you know, Rick used to do that a lot. I remember at one point asking the assistant engineer at the village, like, is there a way we could run a line from the control room into the car? So that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'll just I'm gonna go in the car because you'd have to like you'd have this is like CD days, right? Yeah, you do that, you print the mix, then you'd have to finalize the CD, which whether that I don't know if that means anything to anybody, but I remember it. I remember you kind of like have to finalize the CD, take five minutes, then you take the CD out, you know, two minutes in, you're like, oh the, the snare drum's not loud enough. You know, go back, it's like, right. can I just you know put the chorus on loop and I'll go in the car now and <laughs> listen to it with somebody? But uh, I don't think that ever actually happened. But it, I know I remember asking about it. But I, these days, I sort of sometimes not like I used to though. It used to be like part of the the daily ritual. Mm. Now it's more at the end. You know, maybe you're checking mastering or something. You got the whole here's the whole record. Let's you know, take a drive up the highway and listen to twelve songs. In, you know, in the stack and the spacings yeah, the way you wanted them and see how it feels. Yeah. No, it's like, uh, does it sound good on my phone? Yeah, that's a whole other thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I do often check. I don't check on the phone, but but I do. Um, I'll sometimes broadcast stuff to like a laptop or something. Just yeah, yeah, see. laptop or yeah. An yeah. iMac or some, something. Yeah, like. just like, what does it sound like over there? And like, you, you don't want to make too many big decisions when you're doing that kind of thing. Because, uh, you know, that sort of thing, you know, two years from now, that that thing's not going to sound like that and yeah. some other laptop that sounds it, it, different but um but it's, it's good to like, just kind of keep yourself grounded it's always like do you hear the bass still right yeah yeah you know that's always the the bass is always the thing it's like right you yeah, know i still speakers, use do you still i still hear the grind bands. of the bass do you still hear the notes of the bass you know right i i mean you can see them in the back there i have a pair of venice 10 still that yeah. i always have i don't spend a lot of time on them um, but I do spend a chunk of time and certainly like before I'm done, like when I feel like I'm really close to a mix mm -hmm. with my pro acts and or headphones, I'll go, I'll go to the NS tens and sometimes I'll sit in front of them. Sometimes I'll sit on the couch away from them and just like, is anything poking out weird or is anything lost now? Can I still hear, you know, yeah. the often the NS tens are very revealing for that. That's, yeah. Uh... Also, if you get the bass right on the NS tens, it seems yes. to it seems to translate everywhere really nice. Definitely, you know? like yeah. If uh, it, it, you know, years ago, if you if you had mixed on a set of Gentle X or something that has no kind of a scooped speaker, kind of it was always mm -hmm. like, yeah, uh, that didn't translate well at all. <laughs> now did it? Right. If you right, if you spend too much time on a big speaker or you know super high yeah. speaker, you you know that has a really good low end, and you're you you hear bass because most of the bass is living under eighty hertz or something, and it sounds oh that sounds killer. And then you go to a small speaker, and that speaker doesn't go that low. Yeah, you get that's where the surprises start. Vacant. Yeah. 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 Uh, super chat from Alex S. Thanks. Uh, hey guys, do you rec do recording studios have tech guys there around the clock to fix amps, etc., when artists are recording, or does uh, Dave get the call at three a.m.? <laughs> Dave uh, gets the call. Dave I, gets the I would get the call if it's a tube amp, probably. Yeah. But, uh, and yeah, if it's an emergency and a big record, but you know, God, there's not that many. I hate to say it, there's just not that many records being made. You know, it's, right. it's not like it once was. Um, I mean, I imagine even, you know, it used to be large studios like, you know, West Lakes and everything had that, you know, amazing tech department and everything right. uh, that were that were always there. Yeah. And uh, and, uh, you know, that doesn't happen really these days either. <laughs> you know, right. Yeah. You I know, know over at um, I still call it A&M, but I know it's not a and and Henson, yeah, they still have a pretty, uh, pretty thriving tech department there, and a couple of the other studios, uh, East West, yeah, there's always somebody there. Um, but yeah, some of the other studios, you know, here this is you know not a commercial place, so that we have like local. There's a tech that lives you know an hour up the road or whatever. And there's an amp guy that they know that is close if we need something really fast. Um, but yeah, the days of of the around the clock tech 
departments are definitely well the less way. is needed you know less is needed yeah. now I, you know in the days of <clears throat> tape machines and yeah everything else that were you know precarious and uh, yeah i mean a tape machine right the amount of of, of maintenance and work that you had daily stuff you did with a tape machine you know i haven't touched the pro tools rig in the machine room here in like a year or something you know it's like it's not yeah. it it doesn't really need that kind of care um where you need like a tech staff to yeah. always I mean, obviously there's a big need console here and at times things go south and it's always tragic because we have to get you know bruce from la to come up mm -hmm. and, you know, help us and or whatever it is, but it, you know, you do the best you can. Yeah. Having yeah. backup stuff is sort of being more of a a thing these days. You know, backup modules, backup this, backup. You got two of everything. You try to. Yeah. Biggest problem with the Neve console is it not getting used. Right. Yes. And then the the switches all of a sudden it's like getting crusty, and then eventually right. they well, if you don't use them enough, they just will stop working. Period. Yeah. And, really, yeah, and you have to replace them. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So the more you use them, the better they get. Well, it's like if you don't yeah. drive, like if you own a Ferrari and you don't drive a Ferrari, you know, you just leave it in the in in the garage. You know, uh, I was just talking to uh, a former studio owner that a friend of mine. He was he has a Ferrari now, <laughs> and uh, he sold his studio to Stevie Wonder. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> You know, Sphere Studios. Did you ever yeah. have a chance to work there, Francesco? I've never, I never worked there when it was Sphere, but I know what you're oh, talking yeah, about. Oh yeah, Francesco that owns Sphere. Yeah, he wound up selling it to Stevie Wonder. Oh wow. wow. Um, he's like, I didn't really want to sell it, and you know, and then it was uh, his wife said, "Well, just ask some crazy number for it," and he asked a crazy number, and they said yes. <laughs> yeah, go. fuck! I gotta sell it now. <laughs> yeah when the, but, when the uh, crazy number is taken yeah but yeah you know he was he was always a very anal retentive maintenance hound you know so like everything worked perfectly right. at, at the studio and he was always really like very important to him that everything worked right it was like a great studio right, to yeah. work in but um yeah he said if you know like ferrari he's like you know if you don't drive it can just not work anymore it's gonna stop it's gonna you know the if let's sit in the garage it's just something on it is not gonna work now you know something's gonna be hmm. oxidized or yeah, you know sticky, same thing yeah. with the consoles yeah well, any sw any switch even amps anything anything that doesn't get used a lot will oxidize eventually and like it's not making good contact or it needs to be cleaned or it needs contact cleaner or it needs right stuff uh coxy 5150 dave any official friedman merch coming yeah i'll set up a teespring thing shortly you know you've been saying that a long time i know i've been saying that a long time <laughs> it's very low on my priority list right <laughs> no. it'll happen one day yeah. this decade um shameless plug for motor city guitar yeah hey. yeah for sure um motor city is awesome let's see um so now you're on a break right now greg right you're just mm -hmm. in between projects in between projects yeah that's yeah. cool that's always a good thing right Do yes we... very much yeah so tell us about I, I have to know about um working with black sabbath and and slip oh Black. right yeah i mean the sabbath thing was awesome with the I grew up Sabbath is like one of the early, like what the hell is this kind of moments for me? Um, so the idea of working on that record was really interesting to me. Um, and it was, you know, you always get surprised when you, you sort of have an idea what certain people might be like or whatever. It was awesome. You know, it, it was too bad that, that, you know, we couldn't have all four guys there, but um, but it still was awesome. And you know, working with Tony was crazy. Seeing him, what he does and how he does it was kind of crazy. Geezer Butler was, you know, I thought Geezer Butler was the best bass player in 
hard, heavy music ever. And then I worked with him and realized that I, I was underestimating his abilities. You know, wow. yeah, it was just amazing. like everything, everything. I mean, everything that he played, A, sounded amazing and B, sounded oddly like Geezer Butler was one of definitely one of those. He just picks it up and it's fucking that sounds like yeah, it was. I don't know how he does that. There's a certain weight to his playing. So like yeah, and he doesn't really make, I swear to God, I think he, I, tracking that whole record, I, swear, I think he hit two wrong notes the whole time. I don't know what. And he doesn't, he, he thinks he's horrible. You know, it's it's like a funny little, oh, you know, I don't know if I played that right. It's like, it was amazing. What are you talking about? Yeah, <laughs> leave it alone. It's great. <laughs> it's... Yeah. Um. And Ozzy, you know, I thought it was going to be crazy and out of control with i it was awesome he was funny he was charming he went in there he sang when we tracked um it sang good um it was just uh it was kind of a party the whole time it was just fun and every day was you know light and seeing those guys um you know interact with each other not just in a musical way that was its own crazy thing um but see them interact on a personal level, joking with each other, making fun of each other all the time and stuff. It just, it was awesome. It was totally awesome. And then just, you know, being able to listen to that stuff back, you know, knowing what it was, it was, it was kind of a crazy experience for sure. And, and, um, you know, Rick was a little taken by it too, because he's a huge fan and, and, you know, it was just, it was pretty, pretty insane situation over there. So awesome. what's that phone call like when you get that phone call like, hey, we're going to be working with Black Sabbath? Were you like freaking? Yeah, and it's kind of like one of those calls. Like it's like, hey, or, you know, you kind of know it's in. I kind of knew it was in the works, but no one, you know, no one's talking about. Okay, what's your schedule? You know, for this month and that month, and you want to be like, well, depends on what it is. Right, you know, but but you know, and it, you, without saying it, because if it's Black Sabbath, I'm available. You know, it's it's not. I'll make room. Everything <laughs> is go going on on pause if it's that. But you just, I just, but I remember getting the call. I think I was working. Was I working on a Slipknot record at that time? I forget. I remember where I was, but I was definitely like, I I want to work on that, and I will make it work. I was working on the Metallica through the Never um project it was like a movie that we did like it was 2012 or something 2011 mm. we made it and i was like i will figure out a way to make it happen just let me know where i need to be and when you want me there and i'll do it and that's pretty much how it happened now was there a lot of pre-production before that where they were i was not part of the pre-production of that i know they did a bunch i mean they came in quite well prepared um as wasn't really a there wasn't really a lot of like writing on the floor kind of stuff most of the stuff there's a couple of songs that there's kind of that weird sort of acoustic song that we sort of put together <clears throat> i don't remember the name of it now but um also some of the names of those songs changed from when i worked on it and then it gets uh andrew sheps mixed it and then it gets and then they changed a couple of times when i got the record i was like what is that i don't Oh, they record more stuff now. Listen, oh, it's the other, it's that song, and they changed the name of it or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So there wasn't a lot of I didn't wasn't part of the pre-production, but um, and I don't remember when they came in. I don't remember if they had already rehearsed with um, you know, the the drummer from uh, Rage Against the Machine plays on that record. Mm, right. Um. And I don't I don't remember if they had worked. If they had rehearsed much with him before that, I don't remember. That's a little while ago now. They must have done some, Great but it was drama. definitely a little. Let's figure it out on the floor kind of thing with overall with him. Um, but again, the three, the dudes in the room, Ozzy in the booth, playing top to bottom songs. You know, take three, take four. All right, we got it. Let's move on to the next song. Yeah, pretty like a band. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was. The... I think when we first, like on the first day, they like, you know, broke out the like they're all was I get sounds, 
you know, got a drum sound, got a bass sound, a geezer, got a guitar sound. Okay, we're good. Let's try. Let's let's get our headphones together and like, oh, let's play, you know, War Pigs or something. <laughs> they're like rocking on War Pigs, and I'm sitting in the control room, but cranking the fucking Pro Axe, and just being like, the 16 year old me right now is fucking freaking out, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. right? Totally. It was like yeah. totally like this is just. If you would have told me in you know 1978. While I was, you know, on my skateboard on my way to the record store to get the Never Say Die record or whatever came out in 1978, that, you know, one day, you know, 40 years from now, whatever the hell it was, you're going to be working, you're going to be helping these guys make a record. That would have been like, get the fuck out of here. (laughs) Ridiculous. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty pretty insane i feel that i feel that way a lot of times too with like people i've worked with over the years you know eddie van right. halen and things like that yeah I remember totally the kid from 1986 or 84 or 85 that's yeah. seeing him at you know D- detroit joe lewis arena uh, i'm like he's standing in front of me right now just ripping my face off oh, right like, his guitar exactly. playing and i'm like going oh my god <laughs> This is awesome. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, I, I had yeah. some weird. I worked. I was lucky enough to work on a Johnny Cash records. I worked on a Neil Diamond record, a couple mm-hmm. of Neil Diamond records with Rick. Um, and I was, would growing up, my dad would listen to Johnny Cash and Neil Diamond all the time. And now I'm like, this is like the the nine year old me or the ten year old me. Like, yeah. I think my dad listened to the live Neil Diamond. At the, what is it called? One hot August night or something, right? Mm-hmm. I think. I think I must have heard that record like 500 times one year. I, it was like the only thing that played in the house and in his car or whatever. So when, when I got the call to do that, I was like, not only does it sound awesome, I probably know most of his back catalog better than anybody. <laughs> like, I'm the yeah. guy, I'm the guy for this gig. It was pretty funny. And being able to like, you know, you know, John, he'd be like, Hey Greg, can you bring me a cup of tea? You know, it's just like, okay, that was weird. You know, definitely those moments are just like, this is crazy. How did I end up here? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Super, yeah. super grateful that anything like that could even, that, that I would even think of it, let alone be doing it. It was kind of nutty. Yeah. It's, 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 it is special when you have that connection to your youth and then, then you wind up working with that person later. It's so surreal. It's so weird. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's, it's, you're like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> right yeah 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 i can imagine um so um i was curious i had a question for you uh but oh yeah the, the question came up what you th- you mentioned the stones that you grew up in the stones what do you think of this new stones album i like it i, I haven't i haven't uh, taken a a deep deep dive into it um like i know i will um you know Charlie Watts not being around is, you know, it's, but what are you going to do? You know, he's not here. And, yeah. and, and Wyman too. Yeah. 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 So I still, anytime he, that Mick Jagger wants to sing, I want to listen. And anytime Keith Richards thinks about picking up a guitar, I'd like to see what, I'd like to hear what happens. And um, I think it was, I think it's fun. They're yeah. still making records. I thought it was good. I mean, at least yeah. the little bit yeah. I've heard, I haven't deeply heard it either. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. I I thought it was good. And you know, I don't know. I don't I think I think Andrew did a, Andrew Watt did a pretty good job. Um yeah. uh, oh, his son played his son played for it? No, Andrew Watt, the producer. Oh, okay. I didn't no relation. No, no relation. relation. Okay. I thought oh, not no. Charlie Watt, not Watts. Oh, okay. No, gotcha. no. Um, yeah. So I didn't know how I was going to feel about that with him doing it. Mm. Right. I, I don't know how I felt about the Aussie records that he did. Right. Uh, although they were good songs. He can write a song, I think. Yeah. A good songwriter. I don't know. You know, I think I think you talked about this before too when you were maybe you were going to work with the Scorpions or something and oh yeah, yeah and yeah. uh and you 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 just like oh, I want to make it sound like the old Scorpion, you know, the old the sound, right. you know. Yes. And um I think you mentioned that and and uh I don't know. I think there's a there's a grittier uh less produced Ozzy Osbourne that could 
yes could be brought I out and i think that would be cool you yeah. know and, and and you know you know like early black sabbath records you know this, this is raw and gritty it is and as fun. raw it's as it cool. gets yeah. oh yeah and, very and, raw. and i'd almost like to hear that again you know or something i would love to raw yeah, like I, that you know what i mean yeah. Yes, totally. But and it's it's a trick though, because I've I've been in this situation before many times. It, it, the Scorpions, your I remember talking to you about that. Yeah. Um, that record ended up not not really happening for me because of the pandemic. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. But but even if it would have, I I, re, I know that I wouldn't have been able to totally make it the way I thought it should be because it's their record, you know, it's not mm -hmm. my record, so. So, you know, you can't convince somebody to do, or you can probably, I don't like to try to convince people to do something that they don't want to do or don't, don't really feel good about. But it's always interesting to me when you come up with like that kind of a thing where if you get pushed by like, man, like early Scorpions, we love drive or, you know, the animal magnetism, even mm -hmm. the more, the, the post Uli John Roth era, you know, yeah. the really good stuff. I mean, those records, I still, I could still, I still listen to those records and I still think that those records sound amazing. Mm -hmm. And I would like to make a record that sounds like that, you know? And if I had access to those people that did that, then I think, you know, I know it could happen. It still would have a slightly modern twist on it, sure. but you could go, you could really put a modern twist on it and it still would be good. And it's the Scorpions and it, it would still be good, but but just be a different kind of good. And um, there's something about that old thing. And maybe it's just because what I'm used to, what I grew up on, and it's kind of my roots or whatever, but there's still something about that. Just really big, you know, it's very much more distilled, you know, it's just this, if you removed one thing from some of those early records, the Sabbath, especially is a perfect example. You remove one thing, that record falls apart. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. A modern record, you could remove 10 things and probably most people wouldn't know. You know, it, it's it's a very different way of sort well, of how there's a hundred tracks. Of, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's much stuff's much more dense. And I, I I'm not saying that I don't do that. I do it all the time, make dense records, but sure. but there's something that I my, I am always attracted to this sort of distilled, simplified, and that simplified is not really the right word because sometimes it's not simple at all, but just where it's like it's down to the 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 core things that make it what it is and there's nothing extra it's mm -hmm. all and it, it makes it a lot easier for you to hear everything and get into it you know At it's almost like you want to say all right i'm going to make an, a record it's going to be an analog record and i'm going to do it on a 24 track machine and that's it there's 24 right. tracks it's 24 there's tracks no more one of the yeah yeah no bouncing <laughs> No bouncing, and we're gonna stay off the edge tracks. No, nothing on one and nothing on twenty four. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, then yeah. we're now to twenty two tracks. Yes, yeah. And uh, and and you know that's it. That's what you got in an Eve console. <laughs> yeah, and and you know most of the top fifty record, my favorite top fifty records, probably all fall into that category or damn close. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. I always yeah. said that, like, like that, when the white stripes were in their heyday, and they were, you know, they go to, specifically go to an analog based studio and record a mm -hmm. record on like maybe sixteen tracks. And it's like, right. That's all there is. Eight. Yeah. Yeah. Period. You know, that's it. We're making yeah. the record on this. Right. And, yeah. Right. And that's when like options. Too many options, maybe. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, the drums can eat up like how many tracks alone? Well, it depends on how good you are. And how yeah. good the drummer is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Depends on how you want to do it, but yeah. You know. One track if you're Ringo Starr, I guess, you know. Right. One track if you're Ringo yeah. Starr, or maybe four tracks if you're tracking kind of old school and you got a drummer that can self um yeah. Um volume compensate, so to speak. Yeah. Right. Kind um, of a good drummer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh this is an interesting question. Did uh Kirk record with Greeny? Yes. A, a lot oh yeah wow so some would some people involved in the production sometimes would say too much <laughs> <laughs> again oh, yeah. right no i'm kidding but yeah he's definitely i mean he i mean 
James more has a little bit more of a you know, Kirk always goes greeny, and if he needs, especially if, obviously if he needs a bar, he's going somewhere else. But it's almost always was like it's greeny, or if I need the bar, it's the original Mummy guitar. He's got an ESP. That that Mummy guitar sounds insane. I don't know what the deal is with it. It's it's an ESP. It's got EMGs in it. It sounds great, and you pick up he has a hundred. ESP guitars with EMGs in it, and none of them sound that good. There's one that sounds very close, and then all the other ones sound totally doesn't have that kind of weird honky mid range. That guitar's got a thing about it that's killer. Mm. And the same Greeny is, you know, that's a very good sounding guitar too. Yeah, legendary. Yeah, yeah. What a what a great great album. I mean, great uh, guitar. I mean, I I, yeah. I have I've listened to uh, that Gary Moore Blues for Greeny right album. i've listened to that album so many times yeah <laughs> it's such a great sounding guitar um let's see any other artists that you'd like to uh any great stories tell us about any slipknot i mean you know stories uh, I'm probably got a million of them. i mean you know the slipknot records have always been awesome if we're being talking about heavy music i always really really um love working with those guys it's um, no one that it's always surprising if anyone that even people that like the band understand what the record making process is. And I'm lucky enough to have worked on a record with them with the original lineup with, with when Joey and Paul were still in the band, was still, you know, still, still in there. Um, but even with the records that I've made post that, um, you know, working with Jim and Corey and Clown, especially, is just it and Mick. It, you know, those guitar players are great, really good. I mean, Jim is super creative, super groovy guitar player. I mean, most what they're doing most of the time is pretty crazy and heavy and extreme. You know, Mick could, I think, play, you know, back to forward, eat a peach, no, perfect. Hmm. You know, it, it <laughs> they love guitars, they're geeks about tone. Um, Corey is like a ridiculously, uh, just pro comes in this is a few few people i've ever worked with are coming that like that prepared and ready to just always delivers um jay the drum the drummer that's in there now is awesome guy and he it's kind of a special thing with him because he when he first joined the band i was making that record it was kind of a growing experience he was quite young and didn't have a ton of experience and certainly was in a situation that could have been incredibly overwhelming for him but he he hung in there and you know and you know the level of weird ideas and crazy outside of the box stuff that happens on a slipknot record um, session recording session is pretty cool and most people probably don't really even have any idea but it's super fun and uh super engaging and those guys definitely like are very inviting and make you feel like you're i guess the 10th member of the band, I guess, with those guys. But um, you just get in there and you just become part of the fabric of it all and just work and collaborate. And it's, uh, you know, always a lot of fun and it's very rewarding creatively. Yeah, I was going to ask how challenging it is to work with a band that has, A, that many people, and, and B, you know, everything's so, well, not everything, but a lot of things could be down-tuned a lot and how it's, you yes. know, tuning uh, or excuse me recording versus you know regular standard or you know, right it's a different thing for sure they're too they tune pretty low mm -hmm. they've got two sort of sometimes they're even lower than low but um <laughs> it, <laughs> how much lower is low <laughs> how, <laughs> how low can you go yeah uh, uh you know drop b or whatever <laughs> how about a um <laughs> But they're also oddly um, aware of what it does. I'm, I know Jim lots of times like cutting stuff really low, and he's like, "I can't hear the difference between the open E and the E at the first fret." You know, I know that it's low, but we got what can we do? You know, he's aware of what can happen when you get that low, and you start to like lose a sense of pitch almost, you know. And mm -hmm. even though sometimes it doesn't matter because sometimes it's more about just like this, it's a, more of a feel and an aggression thing that you're trying to get, and being kind of bendy and out of tune is part of the sound too. But at the same time, he's a very good guitar player, and he's 
hyper aware of like i i would like to know if i'm up hitting the what looks like an f or what looks like an e um and i can't really hear that now and then we go and start moving knobs and try to get the mid-range focused enough to where we can get that kind of um you could hear that kind of tonal difference down that low on a guitar you know bass is a whole other story but uh um that's just a good like, when the guitars are that low where does the bass go the bass goes right yeah exactly <laughs> i'm talking about speakers that don't produce low end and you, when you're playing yeah. the fundamental of the note is below most home speakers you get into trouble but um <laughs> but then it, you know you make it up with you put some distortion on it and you make it gritty and you crank a bunch of mid-range into it so that you can hear some grind or something it works yeah but the, yeah. yeah those guys are always awesome you know i've worked with lots of other bands that lots of different scenarios that are fun i worked with a band called the gossip with rick many years ago maybe one of the most fun projects i've ever worked on i didn't really know much about the band before i met them and it was just they were quirky and weird and and hyper talented and super just the guitar player of that band was like like not everything he played always sounded great it was like whatever it was and he somebody's like let's figure out a part don't know hey what was that i don't know like you gotta play play that again now i don't even know what i did it's like it was amazing it was a super fun super fun project and again you know the projects where it gets like it's more creative than just like you're in there with them while they're being creative and you're just sort of you're there to sort of help them capture that stuff those things while it's hot those are the i think the projects that always sort of stick out to me and are the most fun yeah um i got a question here dave for you uh from Alec Dave Freeman, quick question. Many thanks. Did you ever visit or work at Make a Music in Chicago in the Meat District? Just curious. They had several train wreck amps and 50 gold tops. Uh, no, but I did work at the LA Making Music, which was Greg Bale's uh, um, second <clears throat> store here in the early 90s. So, and I did play a train wreck he owned. So, uh, a uh, the um, EL84 one, the um, same one that Pete did a video of recently. Hmm. Okay, God, those are nice amps. Oh yeah, cool, cool mm -hmm. sounding, really yeah. alive, just crazy bright, but in a good way, like bright percussive bright. That's in in just in lovely, lovely bright. <laughs> if you understand and, yeah and the uh the like the harmonics on it were just insane. yeah exceptionally hyper harmonic they were they were amazing yeah. um so when you go from a band like slipknot how's it then you go to working with adele uh, that's like a huge um switch you know it, uh, i've heard that question before, or questions like that before it, it's not you know, it's not that weird. Yeah, it's just still recording. Maybe it would be. Yeah, I mean, I I love crazy next level heavy music like Slipknot, and I love people like Adele that can sing the shit out of a song. Oh yeah. I mean, and I've always been that way. You know, when I was in high school, I remember. You know, when I was in high school, it's like Black Sabbath and ACDC was was my wheelhouse. But I also really, really liked Flock of Seagulls, you know, and and a bunch of the new wave bands that were happening mm -hmm. in the early I mean, 80s. And, my mom and was that was a problem sometimes with some of my friends, you know, hey, gonna, you gotta like, I thought you liked metal or whatever it was, you know, it's like, hey, man, I like music. <laughs> I, right. yeah, I like I melodies. I like cool yeah. words. I like, I agree. I like good grooves. So it's really just like you drop into an Adele session. Um, and it's great music, you know, and I'm excited. I'm just as excited about, you know, a kick-ass ACDC song as I am a kick-ass Adele song. I mean, it. I get similar. I feel this kind of similar way about it when I'm listening to it. So, Yeah, when I was growing up, I could listen to Barbara Streisand. Yeah. You know, beautiful voice, great music. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't put it in my car, but, you know, maybe, a, you know, a, 
but whatever it's you can appreciate right. the fantastic music so right um, yeah. yeah adele that must have been a great experience and that, I mean, that was amazing i didn't know what i don't think any of us knew what we were dropping into there with that record um it was you know put together a rick rick produced the sessions that i worked on and it put together a really 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 great band um and that was just a, one of those uh, definitely similar like what i said earlier like you're in the control room and you're like listening to what's coming out the speakers and you're like oh i don't think i had anything to do with this <laughs> like I don't, know, I don't know how this is happening how is this sounding so good these people are amazing i mean some of the songs on the record that i recorded on that 21 record on that adele record are pretty damn close to live including the vocal um and when you listen to it it's it's hard to understand how that was possible like the drummer on that on those sessions chris dave was like on another planet good i mean everyone on that record was, was amazing oh. um i didn't know chris before that project so i didn't know what i was getting into he was amazing um I, the guitar players i knew really well um the rest of the guys i didn't know the keyboard player either they brought in the guy from the guy that plays keyboards in the roots was like the main keyboard player he was and he knew chris really well or something again just ridiculously amazing and we had like a b3 and a wurlitzer and something else in the in the live room there and then we had a grand piano but that room where we recorded that record is kind of small we had a grand piano like on the other side of the building like in the living room of the house it was like a house place in shangri-la where rick rick's place out there in malibu and we like rigged up some ridiculous video system so he could cut live piano while they were you know just tracking live video of course slightly delayed because we didn't have any cool analog equipment but we we had we figured it out enough and he's you know a musician so he's just listening to his ears um and that some of the stuff there's a song called he won't go on that record that is literally like 95 percent of that thing is a live take and it sounded as good as that record sound it sounded that good uh, in the control room on day one it was ridiculous um, wow just you cool. get it i got it dialed up quick for them and there's it's just a room full of amazing players and that just kind of clicked and she was on a, that was you know she's amazing it was it was hard to understand how because she's i mean at that time she was what 21 years old or something and you listening to that i was like that's a 21 year old that's that British girl that was smoking a cigarette and using curse language five minutes ago. <laughs> is, 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 how is that possible? You know, and it just was. It was, mm. it was funny. She was amazing and awesome. She was super fun to work with. She seems super cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, Paul Crane would like to know uh, thanks for the super chat. If uh, discuss working with John Frusciante, how is that? Uh, no. Um, I. I have not worked a lot with John considering to how much chili pepper stuff I've done. Um, not for any reason in particular, just this is the way either, either the records that I was working on, he wasn't in the band at the time, or I was busy doing vocals. Like when we did the Californication record, we sort of had two rooms. And once things kind of got rolling and I came in, he was in the room doing guitar overdubs and, working with those guys doing background vocals and i was in another room doing lead vocals with with uh with rick so i certainly know john and you know but i don't have a ton of ton of time recording and the few times that i did you know he's he always has a really really good idea of what he wants um and you know the ideas kind of stay out of his way and and let him do it and just help him get his his thoughts down quickly so that he can move on to the next one um but yeah i don't have a ton of a ton of uh, hours working with him face to face so going back to adele you won a grammy for that right yeah i was part of the yeah because well, i worked on the record that was that got the album of the year or whatever yeah uh -huh. yeah that's yeah, that's pretty good that's great <laughs> yeah, it's, it's awesome you know it's especially <laughs> awesome for my mom and my dad but yeah um, that's amazing um, yeah. but fun and weird you know you're up there and you're like oh wow check that out 
Yeah, yeah. check that out. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you ever won any other awards before, or was that your first? Um, you know, I the the heavy music uh, that I've worked on over the years has won many, many, many awards. But as you know, or maybe not, I don't know. The hard rock and the metal performance stuff never makes it to the bra is not on yeah, the they broadcast, never broadcast anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I think for a while there, I was like, you know, five for five and like metal performance or whatever they were calling the, <laughs> the thing at the time. Um, but it's not the same, you know, you don't get a statue, you get a, you get a piece of paper, you get like a little document or something. It's not really, you know, it's, yeah, that's, that's so yeah, yeah, that bullshit. <laughs> really? Oh my God. That's, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. That sucks. That really does suck. You should, you should get a Grammy. You should get the fucking thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it depends on what it was. I mean, it changes every year. It used to be a sort of dependent on what the category was also. Um, but yeah, the metal performance, I forget what they all were, but I know Slipknot, Slipknot was in there. Well, that's awesome. Sure. That's, yeah. Well, congratulations yeah. for winning. All <laughs> Thanks. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um Daniel Belinsky, uh, thanks for the super chat. Greg, I really love how Metallica sounds on the last three albums. Mesa Diesel Marshall, could you please go into more detail when one was used over another and why? What mics, SM57, something else? Hmm. Yeah, wanted. I mean, it's it's always the Mesa is always like a main ingredient, and then you know the 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 diesel brings to the to the table a, a sort of a burly low end that's nice, and James really likes um, the Marshall, especially on this last record, brings a, a mid range thing that is, doesn't come from anywhere else that's really good so it sort of depends on the song um and you know slower songs tend to lean a little more into the diesel fast songs you maybe you don't have the diesel in there at all and you've got a little more of the marshall in there um the the mesa is sort of always a lot of the top end is coming off that mesa and and sort of the bass is sort of for more of a full range than the other ones. But um, as far as mics go, there's not a lot of fifty sevens, mostly four twenty ones for dynamics, and um, for condense. I've always been a ridiculous fan of the KM eighty four um, for a dynamic on a guitar cabinet, as long as it's not too loud. But usually you could deal with it. Um, and that I love that combination, an eighty four and a and a four twenty one. But also there's some four fourteens. I like a 414 on a guitar for the right thing. Um, a couple other little weird things, but th those are the main go-tos. Some 57s, usually 57s for like solos and stuff. But he's asking specifically about Metallica. Um, the rhythm stuff is kind of a little bit, the 57 gets a little a little too narrow or something and doesn't do quite the same thing like a 421 does. Where do you mic the, the speaker solos. on the 421? Usually just off. If it's an old Celestian who's got a small dust cover, it's usually just really close and just sort of where the dust cap meets the, the rest of the car. Right. Right, right, right. It's usually the sweet spot. Yeah. The typical spot. Yeah. Yeah. But it, I just as uh, you know, you don't hear that many people. I know it's kind of Metallica based, but you, that many people just using the 421 um right a lot like brendan always used a 421 and bob too a 421 and and a 57 right land yeah. i was just curious where he was putting the 421 yeah um yeah i mean that's that's most i think i i swear that you, know, you said you were talking about soyas earlier in this thing right I, there's a soyas mic on one of kirk's cabinets and i'm not going to remember what the model is it, but it looks more almost like a like a lollipop kind of a mic or something. Yeah, the one the the one that the the cool one that you, which you should check out if you haven't is a nineteen seventy yeah. three. Really, yeah, really quite a cool sounding full full bodied, uh, full frequency response sort of mic. You mm -hmm. know that that, that right. captures plenty of mids and top, but also fills in in the lows. You know, right. Uh, for an, like almost for a one mic kind of thing, it's would be very great, you know, really good. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I've never had a lot of luck with like ribbons and stuff. I know a lot of people that love them now. I don't know. It's never really. I've certainly used them before, but it's never it never turned into a go to for me. 
So yeah, that's the set in 1973. Got it. Cool. So not, not crazy priced. No, not at all. Oh, that's re the retail too. But yeah, you, you know, the they're the companies in it, um, the sales offices in LA in Koreatown. So you can you can mm -hmm. if you're interested in that, you should contact them. Yeah, I should check them out. Yeah. yeah at least hey, you got a demo you can let me check out. Yeah, I always I'm always, you know, forever trying out new stuff. So uh yeah. cool gc fenix thanks for the super chat question for all you gentlemen what are your some modern groups that give you hope for the future i'm trying not to always look backwards oh uh, hmm. yeah that's tough for me uh i'm always looking backwards <laughs> <laughs> no but I, I i look mammoth uh with wolfgang yeah. sounds fantastic that's amazing um you got the darkness out there Justin yeah, but there, you know, uh, uh, Dirty Honey is not too bad. I heard a oh, new yeah. song by them that I was kind of like, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, I, I still don't know how I feel about, um, I do know how I feel about it. So, a bunch of years ago when they first came out, I, I saw Greta Van Fleet. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm like, oh, okay. I see, ah, oh, the singer is really, actually, Singer's quite good. His voice is a little annoying to me, but but he's a good singer. He's a very controlled singer and like really good. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think they had some a couple things of mine, and I went to a show at the Palladium here a few uh, before the pandemic, and I went with my buddy, and let's just check it out. <laughs> and you know what? They were so awesome live. Yeah, I was like, I was, good. I was like, this is great. You know, I still sort of have a little hope for them because I think I think there's there's some things there that are really cool, and mm -hmm. I think they know. Uh, you know, it's not all Led Zeppelin derivative. It's, but you know, it is definitely older band derivative. Uh, yeah. But man, it's so refreshing to see. <laughs> It's right. just haven't seen it in so many years. You know what I mean? Right. And yeah. and like when you see them live. I mean, we were we were having some drinks and stuff, and we were watching them live, and we we're just like, "This is totally enjoyable." It was like a great I think, experience. I mean, I, I when I first heard them, I thought they sounded great. Of course, yeah. they sounded like like Zeppelin. But when they came out and said, "Like, oh, we're not influenced by Zeppelin," that's when I was kind of like, "What?" <laughs> you know, really? You I think the magic thinking. of that band, though, is the the bass player is actually the, the kind of the magical kid. Uh, he he really. He's an amazing bass player and keyboard player, and he is like the John Paul, modern day John Paul Jones <laughs> right. kind of guy. Right, he plays a bunch of stuff, and yeah. he plays a bunch of stuff, and it, it's really good. And it, and you know, the guitars aren't too distorted, and it just, it just, when you see it live, it just punches and is enjoyable. And it's not that I love all the music, but it was, it was a really good experience. You know, yep. I hope to see more that I really like is I don't see a lot that I really love these days. Well, I'll tell you my son and I know your son, Dave probably does the same thing. He's on Spotify and he'll listen to one band and then they'll just give these suggestions of these other bands. Oh yeah. Like, and then he, he'll, we, we, when we drove up to, to bring him up to college, we let him just man the radio and uh we were listening to all these different bands that i had never heard of before and i just I was like oh that's pretty cool it was a lot you know it was hard yeah. stuff you know the funny thing is the my son for a minute i mean he's you know almost 13 and for a minute he's like he was just going down the wrong path in my book <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know it was like it was like all this hip-hop stuff and 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 stuff and i was like okay well uh, all right and you know, and then all of a sudden it all changed. And then like he's digging back into like Black Sabbath and digging back into all these other things. And I have all these albums in the house, like actual real physical albums, and he's pulling them out and looking at the covers. And so what's this about? You know, asking questions. And then he's digging back into, you know, the Black Sabbaths and Sound Gardens and Nirvanas and and like really great bands but then just what you said 
you know, you tell them one band and then their suggestions on Spotify for other things. Some stuff I've never even heard of, you know, like obscure, kind of obscure things. Right. Yeah. But it's older things, but they're because he's looking at something that's older and it's, it's obscure. You know, I said, hey, you know, you should check this out because he seems to like really loud guitars. He likes loud, heavy guitars. Right. He likes yeah. to love Slipknot. Right. Oh. And, uh, and he, and I go, check out, uh, there's this c- crazy cool old Japanese band from the 80s called Easy O. And uh, it, was a, it was a really cool, heavy band. And I, he goes, he checked that out. But then there was stuff under it that were all this other things. Hey, you ever heard this? And he plays this thing. I'm like, no, but it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, it's just like you're going, you're going down this. Because I don't. I'm like kind of old school. I don't really use Spotify much, you know, because yeah, I, I, I always, I always like to actually give the artist the money and, and you know, we all know why, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, uh, but yeah, that almost made me want to use it more because just to, just to get turned on to some things maybe I don't know about. And then I was listening to Billy Mor- Morrison's radio show on Sirius and then he's his show called Influenced, right? And he's playing some stuff that, you know, never heard and, you know, some English, different English things and things. And, and I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> I brought it up on the show we have with Billy. And, uh, and yeah, it's great. It's, yeah. There's, there's I, music out there. I, I find I need something to maybe inspire me a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. I feel, you know, after a while, you kind of feel like, you don't even give a shit anymore about what, what the music or anything like you once did. I wish you had that feeling like you did when I was a kid, you right. know, when you were so into yeah. it. You right. know, yeah, oh, new band. You get burned out. out after a while. Yeah. Uh, we've got a few more super chat questions. And um, Greg, you good for a few more minutes? A couple minutes. Yeah. I got to be so, just after seven. I got something I got to take care of. But okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll, no we'll wrap it up. Um, Asheville guy. Uh, oh Jesus! Thanks yeah. for the super chat. Hey guys, great show, Greg. When recording a Plexi style amp, what is your signal chain from mic, preamp, EQ, compressor, etc., to the input of your recording medium? Do you use the standard dynamic ribbon comma? We just kind of talked about that, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it would be, you know, Neve mic amps are my go-to always, ten seventy-three or ten eighty-one. Um, I don't almost. N- never compress guitars uh at least not heavy guitars if it's a clean guitar i might um do that but it's kind of a more of a rock thing i don't use a lot of compression eq usually from the neve sometimes i'll pop a pull tech or something like that or a lang or something on it to give it a little more top and bottom um but you know the right mic the right head the right speaker right guitar player <laughs> is a uh, is is the most important thing. I, like I said, I, the ribbon thing has never been a great match for me. I prefer a dynamic and a condenser, but mm-hmm. um, but I know a lot of people that get killer sounds with ribbons. It's just not where I go. Well, you have to mix them with a fifty-seven yeah. or something to get yeah. the cut because the rhythm's kind of dark yeah. and bushy. Yeah. And are there any particular other? pieces of the signal chain that you use such as eq compressors anything i mean the eq i would use like i said it'd be a neve like a 1073 or 108 for guitars 1081 sometimes are a little bit better you got that fourth band i like that and like i said a pull tech eq could help sometimes i'll do like a, a api 550 that's kind of a slipknot guitar sound uh, mm-hmm. not trick but a tool that i like mm-hmm. to use it's got really great mid-range control you can get pretty boost those low mid-range tones in there when you're down tuned it helps helpful it keeps it really punchy too mm. cool great uh anthony de carlo thank you for another great show greg can you go over your favorite favorite vocal chains for recording and mixing vocal chains um the mic would depend on the singer so for someone like a james hetfield it's going to be an sm7 Someone like Adele, what if he's a Telefunken 251? Mm-hmm. So it really depends on, you know, what is Anthony Kiedis is of SM7. I almost always, again, a Neve, Mike Pre is my go-to. 1073 and a vocal I think is very hard to beat. And then 
compression. I I like I do that for a while. I like putting like an eleven seventy six, but also with some like a slower either an LA two A in there too, mm -hmm. or like a stay level something that's a little slower and thicker. Um, and I'll do both of them. It's not that it's super hyper crushed going down, but um, sort of get some of the fast control with the 1176 and the, the the la2 or the stay level is more you almost kind wow. of live in it a little bit mm -hmm. it kind of helps just make it sound a little more together and gives a little fatness to it i guess is the word and you can't go wrong um, with an sm7 or a telefunken no you cannot you can't, you can't, you can't, probably any mic for you probably would be great but yeah yeah can't but i think also you know that with vocals especially the, if you start to get too complicated probably going to regret it later and that goes for eq so almost no eq if you got a good mic you probably shouldn't have to use an eq much except for maybe some filtering or something mm -hmm. yeah and if you use an sm7 mm -hmm. if you do eq later a little bit yeah. on the vocal it takes it very friendly yeah you know it's just like that that in particular for rock guys for sure yeah yeah uh, cars in depth, great young De De Detroit guitarist Brendan Lindsley. You know him, Dave? Nope, I don't. Oh, well, thanks for this suggestion and the super chat. Uh, and the last question for the night KGS 1982. <laughs> uh, best show on the internet, 260 so 60 episodes deep. Keep it up, love what you do. Is that really how many episodes we've done? Well, maybe with uh, all our shorts and everything else, maybe that's <laughs> all the stuff that we've got up there. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't remember That's doing two hundred and sixty. I know we're on one hundred and forty-four. We got about twenty ass Daves, and so yeah, we're we're getting up there. So it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff for you guys to watch. And Greg, I can't thank you enough for coming on. It's a sure. To meet yeah, you thanks, Greg. Your, yeah, it's uh, fun. Thanks, guys. Your career is obviously amazing. Um, and uh, looking forward to hearing what you're going to be doing next. Cool. All right. For sure. Awesome. Good to see you guys. Dave, I'll see you soon, I'm sure. Yeah. Is that Jose still healthy? Didn't it yeah, break it down is, again? Yeah. And then it it, it broke it one. It, we we tried to blow it up once and then we it got repaired and it's all it's solid since okay, it's good. great. Great. Yeah. Good to hear. It's well, awesome. Piece. Well, our next uh our next show, we'll have to get it scheduled. Um, I'm off for two weeks. <clears throat> I'm traveling for work and then uh and then whatever i forget what and then i'm traveling the following weekend to go see my son so up in college so we won't have a show for two weeks and then dave and i'll probably come back for an ask dave show and uh and that's it so guys have a great weekend enjoy you too all right guys. On. yeah greg hang on one second while we say goodbye and okay. uh take care guys all right